the first thing I want to do, as I did last week before we discussed Islam, is to give us a perspective in the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we read, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the ages, the universe, the worlds. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So the first thing to focus on is that God has dealt with humankind through various ways, directly with Adam and Eve, with Cain, with Abel, with Enoch, with Noah, indirectly through prophets. But in these last days, he's dealt with humankind through the Son of God, through Jesus himself. Now, two other passages I would like to go into before we discuss uh, these other cults. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul is writing to Timothy, and in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says to us, the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, in contrast to that false teaching, which he calls, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is telling us that that, that false teaching comes from fallen angels, from demons, from Satan. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, in contrast to that, Paul is telling Timothy, and the things you have heard me say, me, Paul, say, in the presence of many witnesses, in other words, the true gospel, the word of God, these things entrust to faithful men who will also be qualified to teach others. So while Satan has his lies going on through deceivers and people whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron, the Holy Spirit is using the apostolic tradition the handing down the interpretation of the Old and the New Testament through faithful believers to pass on. And this will come out a little later in my teaching. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 3 and 4, we see, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers <coughs> to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn aside to myths, to myths. So Paul has drawn several things to our attention. Number one, we have to be faced with the reality that God, at the fullness of times, spoke to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul, in his sermon on Mars Hill, says that all the way up until the time of Christ, God was dealing with you, with patience, and he winked at uh, certain things, even though he held you accountable, 
But now, with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is a clear message, a clear revelation, and an accountability. He's dealing with us through explicit truth. What is that truth? Christianity, true Christianity, is a faith of a person. It is the faith of a person. That person is God, is revealed in the God man, Jesus Christ. Leighton Polan, who taught at Oxford, made this observation. Now, he has a series of books on the early church, on the church up to the Middle Ages, on the Middle Ages, and then on the Reformation up until the 20th century. And Leighton Pollan made the observation that Christianity is distinct in that it is all about Jesus Christ. As the greatest revelation of who God is and what he's all about. We've seen in these readings that we have been warned, not only by Paul, I, I picked these out because they were very much to the point about modern trends. But Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 makes the same points that the Holy Spirit makes through Paul here. And that is that there's going to be, after the coming of Jesus, there's going to be an increasing amount of false teaching, which are deceptions, lies, by people who are false prophets with false messages, hypocrites for their own personal gain. They say that if you want to understand and recognize something that's counterfeit, that you are to study what? The original, the original. So if you want to recognize counterfeit money, the US dollar is an example, or US hundred dollar bill, you study the real, the original, the real, in order to compare the counterfeit to the real. And it's the same thing in many other things. The more you understand the more we understand our God through Jesus Christ and through his word and through a walking experience of humility with the Holy Spirit in our lives, the more we will sense, the more we will smell the air of the counterfeit. <clears throat> in... Um, History and historiography, you have various uh, famous historians. One of the uh, most famous Protestant historians is a man by the name of Philip Schaff, who wrote an eight volume um, history of the Christian church. Each volume is about 800 pages. And there are 6,000 to 7,000 pages of his church history. You have another excellent historian by the name of Warren Carroll, who has a six volume history of the Christian church. But Philip Schaff made this observation that I think pertains to us. He says, how shall we labor with any effect to build up the church if we have no thorough knowledge of the church's history? History is and must ever continue to be after and next to God's word the richest foundation of wisdom and the surest guide to that which is true. And he makes a good point because many 
of the false religions and of the cults that we experience today, the church dealt with in the Middle Ages and prior to the Middle Ages and in the first several hundred years. And it is important to see how while Paul was telling Timothy this faithful orthodox teaching, you hand it on to faithful men who can teach it to others. Because you see, the debates arose out of what the word of God means. What the word of God says. And so one of the greatest heresies in the early church was denying that Jesus Christ was God himself. That's one of the greatest. Remember I said Christianity is a faith about a person. A faith about a person. Jesus said... To Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me, even though he died, yet he will live. I am the resurrection and the life. And later, he says to his apostles and disciples, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And in Colossians, we read in chapter 1 and 2, that in him, the fullness of deity... The fullness of the Godhood dwelt in bodily form. You may not be aware, but one reason why we are not to say derogatory things to people, even in traffic, even those who are looking down at their cell phone and the light has turned green, or they're in a 70 mile an hour zone going 25 looking down. We're not to say derogatory things to people. For one reason. Among many. But there's one reason you may not be aware of. It says because they are made in the image of God. Think of that. When God created Adam and Eve, male and female created he them. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Our physical image, our spiritual image, our rational image. One, one of the things, unfortunately, that you had from... The ultra and post uh, reformation period is a, a, a lot of emphasis on we're in the image of God vis-a-vis -vis our, our ability to think and so forth. No, the, the Hebrew has no limitations. When it says in the image and likeness, it means everything. You are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically created in the image of God. And because you are in that image... People aren't even supposed to call you bad names. People aren't even supposed to call you bad names. Jesus. In a way that's beyond what we can even think or imagine. Cemented that proposition. When it says in the beginning was the word. And the word was face to face with God. And the word was God. And in the Greek, it's and God himself was the word. 
God. The first word in that clause is theos, emphasizing that the predicate nominative, God, was the word. And then it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Paul says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Fully God, fully man. And so while he's emphasizing that Jesus is a mediator as the perfect man, He's emphasizing that it's as the perfect God man that he shed his blood. That's why in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says the church of God who purchased it with his blood. The antecedent to who purchased is God. Jesus is God. Jesus, we read in Hebrews chapter 1, is the exact representation of God. Jesus took on the body that he himself created. That's why he's called the second Adam. We're not even to say a dumb thing about a person. Because that person is in the image of God. Think about it. That's in the New Testament. That's in James. You cannot even say you dodo. Because that person is in the image of God. This is God telling you that. The point I want to get across is that when God finally spoke to us through his son, Jesus Christ, he became what he created to start with. I mean, that's stupendous. When Jesus rose from the dead, he says to the apostles, to Thomas in particular in John 20, does he not? Come, feel my wounds. Feel my side. It is I. When he finds them fishing and he's on the shore and they think he's a spirit. They think he's just a ghost. You know, the ectoplasm. If you don't know what that term means, that's, that's a term that is used to mean that that's the visible part of a spirit that you can see. He says, no. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And he made them breakfast and ate with them. Our bodies, Paul teaches, are the very temple of God. The promised seed. The promised seed. That was to come. Who is that seed? It was Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, 4, and 5. And John says, the one whom Jesus loved, the disciple closest to Jesus. John says, that seed of God is in us. And it's actually Christ in us, the hope of glory. The promised seed is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Think about that. In your body. You have the eternal God dwelling in you. So that Paul says that our bodies are a naos. Naos is a Greek word that means the holy of holies, the inner temple where God dwells. Not just the total temple structure. Again, as Leighton Pullen said... Christianity is built around the person of God as revealed ultimately through Jesus Christ, his son. So when we see Mormonism 
and Jehovah's Witnesses, when we see the, the cult, the religious cult of Joseph Smith or Charles Russell, we see men who the first thing they do is they pull down God. Mormonism teaches that God was originally a man. Brigham Young thought that that man was Adam. And that over time, he, through works and good works, became God. And he had a wife, and they fathered every living thing in heaven spiritually. And in order for them to become gods, his children, they had to, like him, become put into human bodies and go through trials and tribulations in order to earn the right to be gods. <clears throat> Mormonism teaches that Jesus Christ was the first of innumerable children that God created. That Adam slash God, that, that the first man slash who became God created. And that he was chosen because he had a better plan to make people gods. And so he was allowed to come to earth, take on the form of a man, and do everything he had to do in order to become the son of God. There are 15,800,000 Mormons in the world. To give you an idea, the Southern Baptist Convention is about 15,220,000 by comparison. <clears throat> Mormonism teaches that Jesus and Lucifer, Satan, were brothers. Lucifer was the black sheep of the family, obviously. There is a man, John L. Nevius, who in the 19th century, that's the 1800s, was a missionary to China. And he went over there and he soon realized that he was dealing in many occasions with demon influence, demon powers, demon deceptions, and even demon-possessed people. And he tells many stories. He, ha he has a book on demon uh, possession that I think you can get the PDF online. But at any rate, tells many stories. But there is this one, when he was in the Shanghai area, there was a man by the name of Mr. KWO, Mr. Ko. And he had uh, brought um, an attractive uh, idol <clears throat> into his home. And he started having problems. Uh, Mr. Ko was, was not a Christian. He started having problems with things happening in his house and to his family and uh, would, would communicate with this, with this demon. And uh, many bad things began to take place. And he wanted to get rid of it, even though he was promised a certain life of affluence. You know the story, Dr. Faustus? Give me your soul and I'll give you what you want. And Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world but lose his own soul? Well, he didn't know anything about Jesus or that statement, but, but he had that thought. He had that thought. He said, you know, if I go this far, I'm, I've got a problem. At any rate, he came into contact with the missionary, John L. Nevius. He and his wife were there as missionaries for the Presbyterian Church at that time. And this man was led to Christ. And there was a, an exorcism of, of the house and he got rid of the, uh, the idolatrous image and all that kinds of stuff. Ne Nevius goes on to talk about life after life that was changed through the power of the person of Jesus Christ. 
the person of Jesus Christ. And what was interesting is that some of these demons who were Chinese demons, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I realize that, you know, they're, they're, they're the spirits of Satan and it's not like they're just in China. But the point is that, that they knew who Jesus Christ was. Just like when you see Jesus casting out demons in Matthew, Mark and Luke. And they say, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Have you come to torment us before our time? They knew who Jesus Christ was. Well, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us that Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and these other cults like David Koresh and the Davidians and Jim Jones and so forth are doctrines of demons. They come to lie, to steal, and destroy. It's interesting. Jehovah's Witnesses started with a young man, very talented man, brilliant man, <clears throat> Charles Russell. He had been um, Presbyterian and Congregational back when they believed very fundamentally. He left school at 14 years old and went into business uh, with his dad and he became very, very wealthy. And he sold his businesses after he got an idea to, to start this um, Bible study group. And, and it had various teachings, a lot of it orthodox, a lot of it good teaching originally. He believed Jesus was the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and he was a witness like you can't believe. He witnessed and campaigned and witnessed and witnessed for Christ. At some point in his life, he decided that Jesus really was not the Son of God, not God. That nobody was going to hell. Hell was just a metaphor for the grave. <clears throat> that there would only be 144,000 saved and then that got modified to they would be the only ones truly in heaven and there would be another group of people who would inherit a paradise on earth. So here was a man who started out, we would say good, he started out well, but he didn't persevere in his faith. He exchanged the truth for a lie. Literally. Literally. He exchanged the truth for a lie. I've emphasized over the last several. Ten sermons at least. The importance of. If you are a true believer, you will persevere until the end. If you are truly born again, you will not abandon that faith. And that's why John says in 1 John 2, 19, if they went out from us, that proves they were never of us. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 24, 14, that those who believe unto the end will be saved. He's emphasizing the persistence, the perseverance of true faith. And we've talked before about one of God the Father's jobs is to pluck out hypocrites, to expose people who are not really his. Remember Jesus says that many at the judgment day, we'll say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? And I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Well, he, that's, in, uh, that's in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, about verse 22 through 23. But in Matthew chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, he says that the Father plucks up these false professors, the ones whom he did not plant. He exposes them. Charles Russell created, along with Rutherford after him, created the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it is an amazing lie, an amazing deception.
There's supposed to be a little over 8 million members, but that 20 million attend their services weekly. So I, I don't know exactly how to take that. He teaches, he taught, and Rutherford taught after him that Jesus was actually Michael the Archangel. I found this comment. The ministry of the Spirit is Christocentric. The test of any professed movement of the Spirit, whether in person or corporately, is the place it gives Jesus Christ. The place it gives Jesus Christ. We saw that Islam, we saw last week that Islam teaches that Jesus was born of a virgin. That Islam teaches that Jesus is sinless. That Islam teaches that Jesus was not crucified on the cross, but was raised directly into heaven by Allah. And that he's going to come again and defeat the Antichrist. And set up his millennial kingdom and reign for 40 years and then die and be buried next to Muhammad. But the Koran and the Hadith also teach that Jesus is not God, did not die on the cross, was not buried, did not raised from the dead. What does the cult or the religion do with the real Jesus? Mormon says he's not truly God any more than any of us could ever be. Jehovah's Witnesses says he's Michael, the archangel, and the first of God's creations. At least Jehovah's Witnesses don't make God originally a man. <clears throat> I wanna leave you with this thought. As I said, beginning this next Sunday, I'm going to uh, be preaching in the context of Lent until Easter. We should pray with all of our heart in obedience to God for these people who are deceived. We're to love our enemy. We are to hate the heresy. We are to hate the heresy. But we are to love even our enemy and pray for those who despitefully use us. If you look at Corey Ten Boom or if you look at Wormbrunt, people who were tortured by their Nazi and East German captors, they never failed to witness, they never failed to pray for them. And to hear them, and, and I heard Wormbrandt speak before he died, and the tears were still coming to his eyes on how much he loved these people that were torturing him. And one of those people, he said, as, as he was beating him with a hose and pushing it down his throat to, like drowning, when he saw that Wormbrandt was praying for him with tears coming out of his eyes. He broke down and accepted Christ. Now, we don't cause people to get saved. The Holy Spirit saves. But our job is to be like Jesus. Our job is to be like Jesus. God bless you. Bow with me. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God, light of light, truth of truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to you except through him. We know, Father, that there are babies that die, there are miscarriages, there are people that have never heard anything, and we know that you and your grace and your love will deal with all of that. We have not been given the, 
the answer conclusively to that. But you say unto you belong the secret things, unto us the revealed things. And we're to trust you. We're not to be like that wilderness generation that even though they saw you, even though they heard you, even though they experienced your miracles, they still did not accept you. May our acceptance, even in points where we're ignorant, believe in you, trust in you, honor you, and give us the grace of Jesus Christ to be like him. In Christ's name, amen.